Loving God, you gather us together tenderly as a shepherd gathers their sheep. You bring us together to feed us and to strengthen us with your living water. In you we will find peace. Help us to accept the invitation to come to you. Make us willing to respond to your call and ready to receive you now. Amen. I do welcome you to our Wednesday service, midweek service, and I believe that by hearing the word of God, our faith is increased. By hearing the word of God, our life will never be the same. It's going to be transformed. So I believe as you listen to the word of God today, your life will never be the same. God bless you as you continue to hear the word of God. Amen. Let us pray. To you we come, Father, for you are our refuge for the poor. We draw near with our concerns, for you are a refuge for the need in their distress. In you we pause and rest, for you are a shelter from the storm and a shade from the heat. It is to you that we offer our worship today. Be with us, Father. In your name I pray. Amen. I will ask Brother Ben to come and read from the book of Matthew, chapter 22, verses 1 to 14. Good morning, everyone. Uh, what a beautiful day it is today. Uh, today we'll be uh, off to a wedding in our reading in Matthew 22, 1 to 14. The parable of the wedding banquet. Jesus spoke to them again in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a king who prepared a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his servants to those who had been invited to the banquet to tell them to come, but, he refu but they refused to come. Then he sent some more servants and said, Tell those who have been invited that I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and fattened cattle have been butchered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they paid no attention and went off, one to his field, another to his business. The rest seized his servants, mistreated them and killed them. The king was enraged. He sent his army and destroyed those murderers and burnt their cities. Then he sent, said to his servants, The wedding banquet is ready, but those I have invited did not deserve to come. So go to the street corners and invite to the banquet anyone you find. So the servants went out into the streets and gathered all the people they could find, the bad as well as the good, and the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guests, he noticed a man there who was not wearing wedding clothes. He asked, How did you get in here without wedding clothes, friend? The man was speechless. Then the king told the attendant, Tie him hand and foot and throw him outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are invited, but few are chosen. And this is the powerful word of the Lord this week. Uh, we'll get Johnson back to share what he has for us. Thanks, Johnson. Thank you, Ben, for the reading of the word. I uh, just want to honour God. as we reflect on this word. So my theme today is the king's reception. What are you wearing to the wedding? What are you wearing to the wedding? Go therefore into the ministries and invite everyone you find to the wedding banquet. Matthew 22 verse 9. When you arrive at the church to attend the wedding, most often someone will hand you a program or a bulletin which contains not only the order of service but also the names of the wedding participants. It's a helpful thing to have in hand, especially if you struggle to remember people's names. Maybe you ask yourself, what are the first names of the groom's parents? Is that young man, woman, the maid or the matron of honor? Perhaps you think, I know that I met that groom's man recently. I just can't remember his name. In the world of sports, 
We sometimes say you can't tell the players without a program. Similarly, a wedding program can be a huge help. Now, if only we could persuade the participants to wear numbers on the backs of their uniforms, especially if they are playing soccer, which is the one I love. For me to know that that one is Pogba, that one is uh, Harry Maguire, I, I, I have to see their names written on the back. Something like a wedding program would help us to understand today's scripture from Matthew. Jesus' story is a parable that defies his explanation. In fact, it is what scholars call an allegorical parable. Which means that things in the story actually stand for other things in the allegory. It's hard enough to make sense of the plain meaning of the story. It's even more also when everything in the story stands for something else. Here's one way to think about it. The king in the story is God. The son in the story is Jesus Christ. The marriage feast is the relationship into which Jesus calls and invites us. The slaves are the prophets. Those invited, those who first rejected Jesus Christ. So the story unfolds like this. The king planned a great wedding celebration for his son, Jesus. Long before the day of the wedding, the king sent out save the dead postcards so that everybody would reserve the debt. Then came the formal invitations, each of them addressed in beautiful handwritten calligraph writing. On the day of the wedding, the king sent out his servants saying, the day is here, come to the celebration. But those who had been invited chose not to come. The king sent more servants saying, look, the dinner is ready. The fetid cows have been prepared. The wine has been poured. Won't you please come to the celebration? These men in Matthew's story and Luke's story were kept away by business and family ties. Who could fault them for that? What is wrong with purchasing a land? What is wrong with checking out a business investment? What indeed is wrong with getting married? You see, our Lord's use of the relationship of business and marriage reveals this penetrating insight. These are explanations which most people would readily have accepted. No one would be disposed to blame a person for staying away for either of those two accounts. Whereas if Jesus used some space, superficial pleasure or trivial pastime, the force of the story would have been lost. Everybody recognizes that business and family ties are important. And when anyone puts forth either of these reasons, debate seems out of order. Business is highly important. One has to earn a living for himself or for those dependent upon himself. Let's be realistic about it. And marriage is important. Does not the Bible say that it is not good for a man to live alone and that God has put the, his blessing on the family? So yes, these are important and Jesus did not condemn them. He was once in business himself as he operated a carpenter shop in the city of Nazareth. Earning a livelihood for himself, his widowed mother and his young brothers and sisters. And while Jesus never married, he was certainly no ascetic. He said that marriage was ordained of God and he attended weddings and joined on the festival. So the point that our Lord is making in this parable is that even good things can and often are the enemy of the best. Even things that are right and wholesome and necessary can stand between a man's soul and the kingdom of God. One does not have to do wrong things or even shallow those things to miss the kingdom. So you need to only be preoccupied with good things. Things like business and family can preoccupy you from the kingdom of God. When these good and necessary things keep a man's mind off the kingdom, they become a stumbling block and a snare. So this is why Jesus so often warned men against material possessions and family ties. He saw how absorbing they can be. He saw how completely they can use up one's thoughts and affections so that nothing is left over for the higher things of life. 
And it is a mistaken notion to think that one must renounce business and family to follow God. We don't need to do that. Vows of poverty and celibacy for everyone is now nowhere enjoyed by, by Christ. All that is required is that we keep the claims of this kingdom first in our lives. What it means, yes, we go to work, but also we remember that we've got a day to worship God. What is needed here is the right sense of value and a wise discernment. It was excessive preoccupation with business and family ties that kept these men out of the kingdom. It was not the performance of their necessities of du necessary duties. Well, this parable is being re-enacted every day in the lives of people and in the lives of the church. The great enemy of faith and salvation, even to this day, is preoccupation. People are preoccupied. God is simply crowded out. We do not disbelieve in him, nor do we despise him. Not really. We simply have no time for him. We are not religious, irreligious. We are just busy. We are tired. Other matters are pressing and heaven can always wait. It's not a, a hurry. It can wait. So what was the king to do? He had a son who was eager to marry. And a wedding reception where the salad was wilting and the meat was cold, growing cold. He had to come up with a different strategy. Go into the many streets, said the king, and invite everyone you see. You find the wedding banquet. So the slaves did as they were told, and they brought back all who they found, both good and bad, so that the wedding hall has been filled with guests. Undoubtedly, the first century Christians could relate to this story because it mirrored their own story. It was playing out in their very mindset. As the gospel message spread from these mostly Jewish beginnings and reached out into the main streets of towns and cities, welcoming Jews and well as well as Gentiles, the good as well as the bad, the very nature of their community, the very fabric of their church family began to change. Just as the king once sent his servants into the streets of the city to invite in those they met, both good and bad, so now the king sends us to, the, to do the inviting so that the wedding war, the church, might be filled with guests. So now he's sending us out to bring people. Go tell everyone, come. Come to the wedding banquet. And we're supposed to invite people to the church. This is a scary idea to say the least. It's one thing to invite your friends and neighbors, people who are just like you. It's something much more threatening to invite everyone, the good and the bad, so that the wedding wall will be filled. It raises all sorts of troubling questions. What if they don't look like us? What if they speak with accents? What if they come from another part of the town? What if they are different? On top of all that, we also have one more thing to worry about. What if we do find the courage to invite them? Only to learn that the king finds their presence problematic. Are you as perplexed by the parable as I when the king starts acting like a nightclub bouncer and says to one of the guests, how do you get in here without the proper clothes? This is a wedding banquet. After all, the least you can do is show up wearing the right kind of clothes. So with every once of decency we possess, we want to protest such treatment. We want to say to the king, you just ask it us to go into the streets and invite in everyone, the good and the bad. How can you hold it against them if they don't have the right kind of clothes? Doesn't this seem to contradict the op open, gracious invitation you just ask it to extend? Here's another place in the parable at which we need that wedding program to help us know who is who and what is what. Remember, in an allegorical parable, everything stands for something. So the, this means that the guests who showed up without a wedding garment may stand for those Christians who have found their way into the church, but they failed to clothe themselves in the garments of Christ. Symbols of the new life, yes, invited them to put on. 
And what are those garments? Perhaps the members of Matthew's church would have been familiar with the garments spelled out in Paul's letter to the Colossians. Clothe yourself with compassion, wrote Paul, kindness, humility, meekness, patience, or above, clothe yourself with love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. Colossians 3, verse 12 and 14. Some of you may recall the time when certain restaurants or hotels had a dress code where they expected men, for example, to wear formal and sign written on the um, no jeans or t-shirts by the door. If you showed up at the restaurant and were clearly un underdressed, the management would not refuse to let you in. Instead, they would de secretly loan you some formal clothing that you could fit in. There is a part of me that wishes that the king in the gospel story yet used a similar discretion. Rather than just saving the guest for being under, un, un, underdressed, rather than tossing him out of his ear, tossing him, in fact, into outer darkness, I wish that the king had been a bit more gracious and generous. I wish that the king had said, Sir, you don't attend the party dressed like that. But... Look, here is a spare wedding garment. I would be pleased to loan it to you. That's what I would have expected. But no, the king in the parable gets angry. Not because the single guest was un underdressed. Remember, he stands for something else. Remember, he stands for something else. Rather, the king gets angry because men who called themselves Christians were not acting the way Christians are supposed to act. That's the meaning of this. They failed to clothe themselves in those Christ-like garments of compassion, kindness, meekness, and patience, and above all else, love. So as a result, the king's wrath bent hot against them, and he threw them out because they failed to live up to their end of their bargain. They failed to live up to the scriptures. It's through that all are invited. The good as well as the bad. But it's also true that there is a certain code of conduct for those who accept the invitation and want to call themselves Christian. Once you want to call yourself Christian, there is certain conduct. You change immediately. As Jesus started earlier in Matthew's Gospel, not everyone who says to me, Lord, 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 will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the ones who does the will of my Father in heaven. So in other words, you can't just talk the talk. You need to walk the walk. So the parable tells of the duty of preparedness for the summons of God and the garment stands for the preparation that must be made. Let me ask you, what will you be wearing to the king's reception? <laughs> the invitation has gone out. The time has come. Let me suggest, in the words of the Apostle Paul, that you clothe yourself with Christ. Upon the king's greeting, you'll be let in. Amen to that. Clothe yourself. As let people see that you are a Christian. You don't go by telling them that I'm a Christian. But they will see that you are a Christian because you clothe yourself with Christ. And people are able to see. In the light of all this, here's what I'm going to do tonight before I go to bed. I'm going to write out a list of the Christ-like garments that Paul mentions in Colossians. Compassion, kindness, meekness, patience, and above all else, I will put it in a visible place in my closet. Then tomorrow morning when I open the closet door and say to myself, what shall I wear today? I will come face to face with this little list and then try, if only for that day, to wear one or more of these virtues. I mean real. It is sure. I mean it. Try that. I will try it. I will try to do the same the next day and the day after that. By doing so, other people might even notice that I am really trying to wear the garments of faith, really trying to live the Christ-like life that Christ calls me to live. And who knows, but the king might even find a seat for me and ask me to stay at the wedding feast in the messianic banquet. Isn't that great? That one day, all of us will be at the messianic banquet when we are found dressed in proper wedding coat for the banquet.
May the good Lord bless you as you listen, as you reflect upon these words. In Jesus' name, amen. Let us pray. Lord, we pray for your peace. For those who are burdened with stress and anxiety, come into our tumult. May your presence give strength and calmness. May your peace, which surpasses all understanding, keep our hearts and minds in Jesus Christ. Lord, we pray for your peace. For those who suffer from the wounds of war, violence and hatred, may they know healing and be inspired by the hope of your kingdom. Lord, we pray for peace. For all who be ancient grudges or bitter hatreds, yelled and nurtured over generations, wash away the memory of hate and neglect, that we may know unity and wholeness. May your peace, which surpasses all understanding, keep our hearts and minds together. Send your peace, Lord, that we may think and act and speak harmoniously. Take away all our selfishness so that we can share the joy and feel the sorrows of our neighbors. Father, we pray that we do not forget to put the right clothing, especially when we are invited for this special wedding. Let us clothe Christ. And no king would mistook us for anything. May we receive grace. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all from now and evermore. Amen.